Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today my special guest is Michael Heiser and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Reversing Herman. Enoch, The Watchers, and The Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ, and that's published by our good friends over at Defender Publishing. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me back. Now, I know we likely covered some of this ground when we talked about your excellent book, The Unseen Realm, and that was uh, last year. I'll have links in the show notes for that. But I think it's worth covering a little bit of this ground again, just to give listeners a bit of context for your work in this area of studies. So tell us a bit about how you first got exposed to and developed an interest in things like Genesis 6, 1 to 4, first Enoch and the Watchers. Where did that interest come from? How did that first develop for you? Yeah, it was really in the process of my dissertation. I mean, my dissertation dealt with the divine council in late canonical and second temple Jewish literature. Nice highfalutin title there. All dissertations need a highfalutin title, by the way. So while I was in uh, the process of doing that, you know, I ran across a lot of other things that, you know, were linked to the supernatural world because that's what Divine Counsel was about. And, you know, got into a lot of material there that really wasn't relevant for the dissertation, but sort of took me down a certain path. And it was really good for me because I got for the first time to actually start thinking about how did people in the first century and earlier process passages like Genesis 6, 1 through 4, you know, and that's when you really discover Enoch. You go into the literature, you discover the Book of the Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it it was just a really eye-opening experience, and it became part of my, you know, if I'm, you know, strumming the one-string banjo here, it's, we need to get serious about interpreting the content of Scripture in light of its original context, the context of the writer and the context of his original readers. How would they have processed things? So that's really how I got drawn into it. Well, I know for some of our listeners, for Enoch, the Book of the Giants, that's going to be new to a lot of them unless they've read your new book or have read other books in this space. So talk to us a little bit about what sort of literature that is. And you kind of alluded to this already, but what are some of the important things we can learn from it? And then Tag on to the end of there, whether or not it's inspired, because obviously we're not seeing it in the canon of the Bible. Right. Well, Second Temple Jewish literature is sort of just what it sounds like. Our, the popular term would be intertestamental, and that's basically material that was written any time from the construction of the Second Temple after the exile all the way to the end of that temple, and of course with Herod's additions in 70 AD, but just rounded up to 100 AD. So Let's just call it 500 BC to 100 AD. That's the second temple period for academics. And there's a lot that's written in that period. So, you know, why is it important? Well, in the case of First Enoch and Enochian literature, and Enochian literature is a phrase, again, that academics will use to say, hey, this stuff over here is like First Enoch. You know, it shares some of the same elements. And the Book of the Giants, you know, falls into that. It's important because in the case of the content of reversing Hermon, especially, First Enoch preserves in quite a bit of detail the original flavoring or the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And you might say, well, that sounds anachronistic. How can this later stuff preserve the original context of something way back in Genesis? Well, the answer is, Genesis 6, 1 through 4 had a Mesopotamian context that really we've only, you know, scholars have really only come to know deeply as of 2010, really through the work of a guy named Amar Anus and a few others who went back and looked at all the Babylonian, you know, flood material with a specific eye toward, hey, can we find the stuff in in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, sons of God, you know, cohabiting with women, Nephilim, the giants, all that stuff. Can we find that? in the Mesopotamian material, and Anus marshaled all of it. And what's fascinating is not only can every element of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 be accounted for, but all those elements are also found in First Enoch and other Enochian literature. So that later material actually preserves a context that we aren't given, at least explicitly, 
in the book of Genesis. But we know is there, and we know that's legitimate because some of that material from Enoch winds up in Peter, Second Peter, and Jude, and other places. Reversing Hermon is about how the story bleeds into lots of other New Testament passages, but Second Peter and Jude are the big ones, because we have a reference there to the angels that sinned, angels plural. There is no other candidate in the Old Testament for a corporate angelic rebellion, and they are kept in chains of gloomy darkness. Genesis doesn't have that, but guess what? Enoch does, and so does the Mesopotamian material. These are the sort of connections that you see that Enoch's content on the, these points actually captures and preserves the original context for Genesis 6, 1 through 4. We can drill down you know, on, on any of that if you like, but the, your last question about whether it's inspired or not, I don't think first Enoch is inspired. I don't think any of the Enochian material is inspired, nor do I have to. I'll be honest with you. I understand this question because Enoch had its defenders in the early church. I have a whole appendix in my book about the canonical status of first Enoch. It is cited as scripture in the Qumran community, but what does that tell you? It tells you one sect of Judaism thought it, it was inspired. You know, a handful of church fathers, you know, people who wrote in the early church period did. But at the end of the day, they were willing to acquiesce to the movement of the Spirit that said, no, the church en masse, the Spirit who indwells all believers, is not leading the church corporately to recognize this as something that belongs in the New Testament. And they were fine with it. So on the one hand, I understand the question, but the question is a bit misguided because biblical writers quote lots of things. You know, they quote the Baal cycle in the Old Testament. Oh, well, should we consider that inspired? You know, they quote the wisdom of Amenemope. They quote secular Greek poets. We don't really have this discussion on any of these other things except for Enoch, and it's because of this early church attachment to the book. But it's completely unnecessary. A book can be useful and it really was to New Testament writers to help them articulate certain things. A book can be useful. It doesn't have to be inspired to fulfill that criterion. Next, let's get into who actually are the watchers. When people use that term, what are they referring to? And then what was their sin? What's the sin that they're specifically known for? The watchers is the Enochian term. I mean, it's, it's actually a biblical term. It shows up a few times in, in the book of Daniel. But it's the Enochian term for the sons of God from Genesis 6, 1 through 4, these divine beings that do what's described in Genesis 6 there. And again, in, in Unseen Realm, I, I basically articulate the fact that there are two supernatural views, not just one. The one is the cohabitation view, and then there's another view. And if you want to find out what that is, go read Unseen Realm. But this is Enoch's term for these guys. And on the one hand, what happens with the women is a transgression. If that's evil, that's what they're imprisoned for, in part. There's something else that's missing, though. If you read through the Enoch story, what they're really sort of charged with, and this is where the New Testament writers, the thing they pick up on, is that the Watchers are blamed for taking very you know, sort of normal you know, human technologies, you know, how to make bronze, you know, how to make iron, cosmetics, astrology, just observing the stars and what they do and speculating about that. In and of themselves, you know, these things, they might be innocuous or bad, depending on how they're used and so on and so forth. You know, roots and plants, and you know, that could just be medicine or sorcery. You know, where's the line there? Well, the, the watchers are blamed for encouraging people and really tempting people influencing people to cross all of these lines. And so they get blamed for helping humans to destroy themselves and become idolaters in the end. And that is a huge offense. And by the way, this is the backdrop to Babylon, the whole mystery Babylon talk in the New Testament, because the watchers are associated with Babylon. Why? How? How does that work? I don't read that in Genesis. You get that because of the original Mesopotamian context. So this is really what's laid at their feet, the corruption of humanity, depravity. I like to put it this way. If you ask the average Christian, hey, why is the world the mess that it is? The answer you're going to get is the fall, Genesis 3. If you asked a first century Jew the same question, that is not the answer you would get. You would get a threefold answer. Yes, the fall, you know, that's where human and divine rebellion begins. Genesis 6 is the second problem, and then the third problem is the dispersion of the nations, you know, allotting them to lesser gods at Babel, Deuteronomy 32, 8, and 9, which turned into an idolatrous situation. So the Messiah, for a first century Jew, is supposed to reverse 
all of these things, to fix all of these things, not just Genesis 3, but all of them. And in this book, Reversing Hermon, I drill down on the second one, the whole Genesis 6 Watcher issue. And we obviously have to talk about Mount Hermon, because obviously you're referencing that in the title. For people who aren't familiar with this sort of literature, what's so significant about Mount Hermon? Yeah, Mount Hermon in Enoch, and again, other Enochian books, is the mountain to which the Watchers descended and took an oath among themselves to corrupt humanity. So that's why I used it for the title, that that whole set of circumstances begins there. And so the Messiah was expected to reverse all of the fallout, all the things that ensued to corrupt and destroy humanity you know, from this particular event. Now, Hermon it gets bad associations in the Old Testament. Again, if I dealt with this in the unseen realm, that this is at the foot of the territory of Bashan, and Bashan, of course, was known as the cult of Dan, you know, for, for the cult of Dan, which was a cult to Baal. In Jesus' day, it was a cult you know, to Pan and Zeus. But Baal was the big guy, Baalzebul. Again, that becomes a title for Satan. Baal's a Satan figure. So it's known for that. It's known for, uh, as you know, the place where the, the, the last of the Rephaim, the giant clans back in Deuteronomy 2 and 3, that was their turf. So it, it has its own bad associations biblically. But in the Enoch story, and again, there's a Mesopotamian tie in here, this becomes sort of ground zero. The Mesopotamian connection is that Mount Hermon was also the place that the Anunnaki gods were thought to reside. They were the ones who essentially were the gods of hell, the gods of the underworld. They were punished and sent there. For some reason, we're not told. The Apkalu, who are the Genesis, the Watcher counterparts in Mesopotamian literature, they're also sent down there. There could be an association there as well, but this wasn't a good place. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Is it kind of seen as a gateway to the underworld in some regards? Yeah, and specifically, like Ashtaroth and Edrai in the region of Bashan are referred to just precisely as that, gateways to the underworld, to the netherworld in Ugaritic texts. Again, I deal with that in Unseen Realm, but the whole region, again, was this cosmic place, and it wasn't the cosmic good place, it was the cosmic bad place. This is one of the reference, not the only one, but to this whole heights of the north, you know, Baal's domain in the north, to the north of Yahweh's inheritance, Yahweh's holy land, you know, Canaan. Again, it just had evil connotations all over it. And so Hermon, again, became this focal point for lots of Jews. And again, their expectation would be that the Messiah isn't going to just fix what happened in Genesis 3. It's not just about our estrangement from God, which is obviously serious. It's not just about curing the death problem. Hey, you know, we would like eternal life with the Lord. But it's also about retarding and fixing and healing depravity and human self-destruction. Well, you've already given us a context for how this impacts our reading of really Genesis 6, 1 to 4. So I'm going to skip that question and keep moving forward. How does all this better inform our understanding of what we see Jesus doing in the Gospels? What is he doing specifically to reverse what people would have understand as being wrong with what happened at Hermon. Yeah, there are a number of connections here. One of the sections of the book is focused on the Gospels. So there are the New Testament writers, again, the, the thesis of the book is that the Watcher story and the Enoch's telling of it is sort of floating around in the heads of first century Jewish writers, including the, you know, the guys who wrote the New Testament, or at least for the most part, they were Jewish. So there are hints that this backstory is behind certain things that they write. There are clues in the genealogy. Again, this chapter is based on a recent dissertation by a, a woman named Amy Richter at Marquette, who looks at the women in, in Jesus' genealogy and shows how textually, if you're reading the primary sources, there are vocabulary and phrase attachments back to Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in the stories of those women who wind up in the gospel. Of course, her point is that what this telegraphs to a Jewish reader is that these women who all have these backstory attachments to the Watchers and what they did, their corruption of humanity, the one they produce, Jesus, the one they help bring to earth you know, in the incarnation, Jesus of Nazareth, is going to be the one who heals all that. There are things about the birth timing, the chronology, the circumstance. Again, if you take certain passages as being, again, in the Jewish mind, fairly literalistically, like you know, with star alignments and whatnot, things in, from Revelation 12, for instance, 
you wind up with Jesus and Noah sharing a birthday. Well, that's a big deal because Noah was the first one who was supposed to kickstart the good humanity again after the whole Genesis 6 incident and the flood. We know from the biblical story that he didn't finish the job. Well, who's going to finish the job? That would be the Messiah. And they share a birthday, so this is a sign. And there are other connections in there, too. You know, where Jesus goes, certain places, what he says, even what demonic beings say. Again, draw on this story. And so there's a matrix of ideas floating around in the writer's head. And some of what they write bears a relationship and an attachment to this story. And so if we're thinking what they're thinking, it helps us understand what they wanted to communicate to their original readers. Well, let's keep moving ahead further in the New Testament. How does this better inform what we see happening in the epistles and then also the book of Revelation? Yeah, the epistles, there are you know some really significant, I think, and, and very interesting passages. Paul, for instance, when he says that the law was added because of transgressions, Everyone immediately thinks, well, that was, you know, the Israelites or Adam and Eve or something like that. Well, in scholarship, there are a number of things in Galatians 3 and 4 that scholars have struggled with operating from that presupposition. So in this chapter, I draw on the work of a guy named Tyler Stewart, who was a doctoral student. Uh, He's probably done now uh, at Marquette again. But he asked the question, hey, the law was added because of transgressions. Just whose transgressions are we talking about? He said, could it be the watcher's transgressions? And he takes that assumption, and then he goes back into Second Temple Jewish literature, and lo and behold, there are people who read it that way. And if you read it that way, it makes sense of some of the other things in the passage that scholars have struggled with. There's the whole thing in Peter. Why does Peter mix baptism, the ark, the flood, the spirits in prison, the resurrection, and Jesus? I mean, did he just get bored and say, I'm just going to throw it all into a chapter and let people deal with it? No, there's something going on there. As Adam was a type of Christ for Paul, Enoch is a type of Christ for Peter. And again, there's a way to read that chapter that makes perfect sense out of what's in the chapter, even though to us it looks like a total mess and just weird. There are places like this in Revelation, references to certain things about the Antichrist that for a Second Temple Jew would have been read a lot differently. Believe it or not, Judaism had a profile of Antichrist before we even had the Christ on earth. You say, well, how does that work? Well, it depends how you frame it. They had a profile of the great end times enemy who would oppose the Messiah. And that profile, which we understand to be really talking about the Antichrist, has certain connections back to the Hermon incident, back to Babylon, the Apkalu, Again, who are the Mesopotamian equivalents to the Watchers, to the Giants? Again, how would a first century Jew have read this material? And then when it comes out in the New Testament, there are certain phrases used, certain things said. If we have the Enoch story in our head, all of a sudden, you know, certain passages just open up and give us interpretive possibilities. At least we can see how, okay, this may have been really what the author was thinking. And we know that because there are lots of other people in his time period thinking the same thing. So this is what I'm trying to do in the book. I'm trying to get readers exposed to the fact that this backstory about the sins of the Watchers and how the Messiah would reverse them is floating around in the New Testament writer's head, and it leaks out into certain passages. And we just wouldn't suspect it at all. But there it is, if you read it through a a different lens, lens of the first century Jew. For the listener who's still wondering, you know, why is it important for me to be exposed to this sort of material? And I think we could apply this to other kind of extra biblical material, but something that's influencing the lens that the writers or the people of that time frame would have been viewing that material through. Ultimately, how is that going to be beneficial? How will that kind of expand your world view, your understanding of the Bible? I would say if the question is, how does this help my understanding of the Bible? The answer ought to be academic. Do you want to know what the writer was trying to communicate or not? I mean, it's just that fundamental. It's that simple. Now, you know, I'm not going to say that if you didn't read Unseen Realm and if you didn't read Reversing Hermit, you'd miss the gospel. Of course not. The gospel is simple. It's straightforward. It's cross-cultural. We get that. But if you want to understand your Bible, this thing that you say is the Word of God, this thing that you say is inspired, 
Well, then you might want to consider trying to get inside the writer's head and have the writers kind of live in your head. Try to understand what they were under inspiration trying to communicate to their original audience because they're writing to an audience. And that audience is only going to understand what that person who is their contemporary is going to be able to express. We miss a lot of that because we're thousands of years removed. So do you want to better understand the text of this thing you say is inspired better or not? So I think that's a fundamental question really for anything. And it's not just Enoch. There are lots of books, lots of material written in the Second Temple period that, you know, frankly, just unlock passages in the New Testament that if you don't have this other material in your head, like the New Testament writer did, like the author did, if you don't have that in your head, yes, you can still get the gospel, but you really, frankly, don't have a prayer of understanding this or that passage correctly. And that ought to matter. For the person who wants to go beyond what you share in Reversing Herman, and obviously we've mentioned the Unseen Realm a number of times, are there one or two other resources in addition to this book that you might recommend? Yeah, I would say, I mean, people have to realize what Reversing Hermon is. Reversing Hermon is, like Unseen Realm, a synthesis of high academic scholarship on these subjects. This isn't Mike sitting in his basement coming up with a book. Okay, this is Mike going through peer-reviewed scholarship and collecting it between two covers, and then hopefully trying to write in such a way that I can communicate its import and its content to the average person, the non-specialist. There's really no other book that does that, but beyond this, I would suggest it may be a survey of Second Temple Jewish literature. Larry Hellyer, H-E-L-Y-E-R, has written a good one. He's an evangelical as well. So I would suggest that. And you might also just want to read this material. So get a copy of an English translation of Enoch or the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha or something like this. You need to start using the resources that are at our disposal to read what biblical writers read that, again, once you read something, it's going to stick with you. And so if you know that material, you'll understand what the New Testament writers produced a little bit better. So Start reading the primary sources in English. They're all available. And get an introduction to Second Temple literature. Well, that's very helpful. And I'll be sure to include links in the show notes for this episode. So if you're interested in any of those resources, you can just click right on through. And my comment would be as well for Reversing Hermon and the Unseen Realm. Both of those books are very readable. So if you're thinking, well, gosh, this sounds too academic for me or academic type literature would scare you. This is not written in a way that it's going to feel stuffy or overly academic. I think Mike's sense of humor comes through in a lot of his writing, and it's a very enjoyable read. So that would be my encouragement. Don't be scared. It might be topics that you're not used to reading, but I think you're going to enjoy the process of reading and consuming the content. Now, Mike, if listeners want to connect with you and find out more about this new book, find out more about some of your other work, you've got a podcast and, and a bunch of different things going on right now, where can they find you on the web to connect with those materials? Well, the main site, the nerve center is drmsh.com. So DR is for doctor, MSH are my initials, drmsh.com. If you want to listen to the podcast, it's nakedbiblepodcast.com. But of course, you can find that through the homepage as well. And again, we'll link that up in the show notes. So if you want to check out that material as well, you can just click on through. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Michael Heiser. Once again, our book today was Reversing Hermon. To connect with Michael, be sure to follow him on Twitter, where he goes by the Twitter handle at MSHeiser. For more on the book, you can visit his website at drmsh.com. The book is available on Amazon, it's available on Barnes & Noble, and you can also get it directly from the publisher. And the address for their web store is skywatchtvstore.com. Mike, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you again. Thank you for having me back. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Hey, 